19, 2019, a washed up duo of bench racers were sent to RC prison for the crime of on track race incidents. These men fled Facebook to the platform of Podbean to safely threw their garbage without any listeners. Wanted by stock racers, they survive with weekly episodes. If you have a problem and don't want a solution and are okay with not using iTunes, then you can listen to the Trackwalk RC Podcast. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Trackwalk RC podcast, joining us for episode number 29. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and uh, you guys are getting to take advantage of a snow day episode. You're going to get two episodes in a week. This has never happened before, so don't count on that sticking around, but be thankful. <laughs> yeah. Colin and I are stuck at home thanks to uh, 2020 Snowmageddon, so... That meant that we had nothing to do, and we thought we should bring you guys another episode, so here we are. The only time ever that five inches has caused havoc. Oh, I know. I don't even have five inches here yet. <laughs> like, it's all ice. <laughs> That's not where I was going with that, but... <laughs> <laughs> Gee hee. Anyways. Um, but yeah, we also thought that we had quite a bit to talk about that we left off the last episode, because it was already four hours long, and, well... <laughs> I think we're back something to be said for episodes that are a little too long so here we are episode 29 we have a whole slate of things that we also want to talk about today and uh we'll be getting to and i know that we'll be getting to listener questions later and i posted up that thread super late so that segment might be a bit short but if you were able to get a question in time then good on you and we're gonna get that answered so pretty sweet track walk news actually and well just i think good news for everyone is that yesterday I found a new place. Yay! So, no more uh, hour and a half trip from Camino to Woodenville. That was my work commute one way. Um, that was with pretty decent traffic. So, moving to Bothell now. We've, Hep and I found a sweet apartment yesterday. Um, and so that's going to be good, which means that I'm going to have a not nearly as janky recording setup, and we're going to get to bring you content way more frequently. So, be thrilled for that, because uh, it looks like weekly episodes are going to get tabled for a while. They probably won't start again until February, uh, but when that time comes, uh, we're going to be rolling these out pretty often, along with all the other cool track walk content that I've been hinting at all winter long. So, pretty excited for that, and pretty excited for my work commute, too. That's going to be sweet. Yeah, that's. I felt bad for you. <clears throat> Back and forth, three hours at least commute every day. Yeah, you know, it's just, you lose so much time. Yeah, like, you're, you get home and you're done, your day's yeah. done, you get laundry done or whatever, and you're going to bed already. Yeah, and that was, like, that was why we had stopped recording at the frequency that we were, because, like, you lose 12 hours, and I spend 15 hours a week during the week driving. That doesn't count that, like, I usually go somewhere on the weekends, whether it be racing or running errands, like, you know, I can't get anything done during the day during work, generally, so... Yeah, I mean, it's between myself, like, just being exhausted, my poor car, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it was time, and it just kind of fell into our lap, so that is great news for track walk, that's for sure, because track walk's gonna be back in full, full force. Uh, I'm so, so excited. Absolutely thrilled. So, how you doing, Colin? You enjoying the snow day? I always enjoy a snow day, because up here in the northwest, it, uh, 
in the west side anyway it usually only lasts for a couple of days and then it's gone and we're back to our usual rain again so yeah. it's kind of, kind of nice to have the snow coming down once in a while i like it i just wish i had a crawler or a monster truck or something to go out and play in the snow with yeah that makes sense that would be so much fun right now i used to do that as a kid with my my blackfoot and that was so much fun. I wish I could do that. I wish I had a monster truck or one of those axial grave digger monster trucks <laughs> or something yeah. like that. That would just be so much fun in the snow right now uh, for the one or two times a year we get to <laughs> get to enjoy the snow. So Yeah, that's that was kind of a <laughs> well, after after I got into RC and we still had our slashes, we only had the one race that I went to in 2010 at, in the fall. So for us in Central Oregon, snow comes pretty early in the, uh, well, pretty much late fall, right? So That's we, when you were living in Bend, right? That's when I was living in Bend, yeah. So yeah. we uh, we had taken the the snow that we had, we had built up these, you know, built them up into a big mound. <laughs> and uh, we were trying to drive through, and it's just kind of driving through the snow. And so we had to think about it. And so we, we uh, the pipes hadn't frozen yet, so we had taken our hose out, and we had hosed over the snow jump that we had made and froze it over so it would stay solid. <laughs> and so we were, you know, in our early bashing days, launching our uh, our slashes off the front lawn into the, <laughs> into the sidewalk <laughs> from our uh, from our doorstep, pretty much. It was a pretty good time. And we only did that a couple times after I moved up here. And then, you know, as, as it usually goes for everybody, everyone gets super serious in racing, and that's what we did. So I do miss that a little bit. I don't think I have a slash ready to go right now. You gotta have a crawler or something you can take out in the snow. Like, what's your dad doing today? He's gotta be out in the snow playing. No, he's working. There's still hobby expo stuff. We're still trying to get the drag car put together for the expo. Oh, right, um, right. Which what a nightmare that's turning out to be. So <laughs> I, I ordered my tires and wheels this week. Yeah, we, we have ours. Um we have the S threes. Yeah, that's what uh, I ordered. Yeah, that that There's... seems to be the, the compound of choice amongst okay. everyone. Um so yeah, uh, which I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm the only issues I think why we haven't taken the crawlers out is because it'd be such a pain in the ass to clean them afterwards. So yeah, I'd rather just not. No, it'll 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 melt. It'll come off, and then you just hose it down with WD forty, and you're good to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. But um, yeah, so the drag car. So anyone that well is local to us. And local to the west side over here kind of understands that there's been a sudden surge of the uh, no prep drag racing, which I'm super excited for. Like, I'm, I knew RC is always cool, so I'm super excited for what that's going to turn out to be. I think we're going to start doing it at Die Hard this summer, and everyone's building their, their big no prep cars that are uh, sort of based off, like, the short course chassis. So we obviously, you know, catching on with the trend, we decided we wanted to do it too. And so we had this T5M. I don't remember where we got it. But someone, we got this T5M from somebody. And we found somebody on Marketplace, go figure, that had a SC10 roller. And we traded the T5 straight up for this SC10 roller, like original SC10. And what a hunk of shit. Like... The the photos and everything were so misleading. I mean, it came it came here with like the servo halfway unmounted, like all the screws were coming out. Um, he had been using like servo, like the servo spacer washers to to space out his shocks on the bottom. Had no shock standoffs. Was missing hexes and pins and. But it's mint, man. Oh yeah, it's like new. Yeah. Ran once. Yeah. <laughs> And so we get this thing with, like, two Ziploc bags of, like, all the shit it needs to run. And we're like, wow, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Some assembly a, required. Yeah, so we, we, we put a couple orders in. Like, we, I had to take it apart just because it was, like, looking at this thing the other day. I put a video up on the SOR page. And I was looking at this thing the other day going, I have a week to put this car together. And every time I turn this thing around, I find something new wrong with it. <laughs> so, uh, we finally stripped the thing completely down. It's sitting on the workbench outside. And, like, went in and put a bunch of orders in of all the stuff we need to convert it. 
And now I'm feeling a little bit better about it, so I'm really excited to see. But anybody who saw that SOR video um, saw how just fucking sweet that thing was. So I'm pretty excited to see how it'll look in the end. But wow, I really wish we would have just bought the bullet or bit the bullet, excuse me, and bought like a DB10 or something, which was what most people were com- converting them from. Yeah. So we'll see. But it looks like there's quite a bit of people showing up at the expo with them. I think uh, eight or nine people got on the Die Hard page and we're talking about it. Right. I, I kind of went a different direction with it. Um, I don't have a short course truck yet. I'm trying to get my hands on one. And when I do, I'll build a proper, uh, what is it, outlaw, street outlaw car. But for now, it's a street outlaw car. It's going to be, I'm just taking one of my, my two wheel buggies from last year. And I've got that, that hot rod body that I think everybody has seen. I'm going to put that on it with some slicks and, and play with that for a little while until I get my hands on a, a proper serpent short course truck. Yeah, that'll be cool. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't exactly fit into the street outlaw rules, but I think uh, it's it's going to be at a huge disadvantage compared to what the street outlaw trucks or cars really are. So, sure. For now, it'll just be fun to do burnouts and try to get the thing down the track. So that's what it's all about: just out having fun and doing some drag racing. I think it's going to be cool. Like I, I'm really excited for it and. I know that that's going to be kind of a big draw for them at Die Hard. I mean, they're always trying to expand stuff at the park, right? Especially since like losing planes was a huge, huge bummer. Oh, they need so, to they need to pave the uh, the field where they were using it for flying. I know, because <laughs> I think so that sick. that road that they're using is a little bumpy, isn't it? You know, I don't know actually. I mean, I haven't been out there in a while, but that was what they were going to use for it. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know. I they seem to think it was okay. Okay. So we'll just have to play around with it. I mean, I guess that's kind of the benefit is, you know, it's not supposed to be a prepped track. Yeah. Well, so, they'll, they'll have to do like Wednesday night, Thursday night races out there or something, drag racing. Yeah. We could go right after work. That'd be awesome. Oh, I know. There's <laughs> gonna be there's gonna be too many things to do out there. So every night it's gonna be like, yeah, sorry, honey, I'm gonna be going home late. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to the park again. Yep. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, so that's gonna be super cool. So we'll see how that turns out, and I'll be trying to cover that pretty heavily um, at the expo and beyond. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, I don't think um, I'll. I, I'm not gonna have mine ready put together by the expo i don't think i just i don't have time i'm prepping what three cars now that yeah. I, need, I need to have done by that weekend so i'm not gonna know, add, I, not gonna add a fourth <laughs> i still have my own to do so now that i actually get to race the expo yay well, <laughs> what was there a de- was there a development there or something changed yeah so what happened was is that brandon was originally going to reedy and he wasn't going to be available to do uh, hobby expo because we uh gen- you, i mean anyone that's racing at die hard which i think is the vast majority of our listeners know that brandon and i obviously tag team the rd thing with brett and so brandon was going to be at re now he's not able to go so he will be available which meant that i didn't have to do it pretty much alone and so now we can rotate all three of us. It'll be majority Brandon and I. So Brett can, you know, do Brett things and go talk to people and sort of reach out, you know, diehard stuff. Do and Brett things. <laughs> do Brett things. And um, which is good. That's a good weekend for that. So that'll be nice, which meant that that takes a little bit of a load off me and I can race two wheel mod and not take away from the program too much. So we... And then I guess Wildy's plans sort of fell through for that weekend too, which meant that Wildy was going to be available. But I mean, which we appreciated for sure. Uh, he he was willing to come out and do the event for us then. But Brett seemed pretty confident in in what we were able to do for that weekend, just because I think not a lot of people on our side and our racers at Die Hard know Wildy very well, and so I think Brett wanted to go with someone. Or go with the group of people that everyone's most familiar with and comfortable with. Oh, Brett's got um, Brett's got faith in, in 
and he knows you can get it done. So that's... yeah, yeah, which we appreciate a lot, and that was cool. But I was sitting here also thinking, like, hey, you bring bring Wildy over. I think that'd be awesome because I think it'd be a real treat for a lot of the racers to get an event ran by him. So right. maybe we'll maybe we can do something in the summer. Um, maybe I, I don't know what their plans are for like turf wars and stuff this year. Obviously, that is way way beyond what we're even talking about right now. But it'd be cool to get Wildy over for something. Uh, soon because i think it'd be really cool uh I, he really wants to come see what's going on over here and i think that also it'd be really fun to get the racers to experience a wildy event i Tent, think. Tent scale nats at die hard <laughs> yeah yeah thanks roar yeah thanks for the email back <laughs> oh the god that would be such a cool event i keep thinking about that how awesome yeah, that would be god i know it would be pretty sweet um, I mean, we all obviously we talked about that on several episodes ago. I mean, yeah, but I I think that that would have been cool. But typical roar fashion had to do something exactly the same as they do every year. So whatever. Yeah, they're not ready to step out of the box yet and switch from clay. To, yeah, uh, well, I figured by by maybe twenty thirty five. 2035. Roar might be in a position where they might consider carpet. So we'll see. Oh, I'll be 60 by then. <laughs> God. So, anyhow, that's pretty much uh, yeah, I mean, welcome to episode 29. And we really appreciate all your guys' support as always. It seems like a lot of people have enjoyed 28. Those of you who have listened to it up to the point that we're recording this, because I know it's been it's been up and live for less than 24 hours. So that episode was actually not even supposed to be re- released until Friday, uh, the 17th, which is probably when this episode's coming out. And I, I mean, it just, it had been so long without an episode. I couldn't, I couldn't make you guys wait for that. So normally, well, from this point on, essentially like episode 29 and further, you'll get an early release on Patreon, probably about two days earlier. Uh, so this episode should be available on Wednesday, so probably tomorrow. And um, the issue that I had with this last episode trying to put it on Patreon is I have to do it in two parts because Patreon has really strict uploading uh, requirements for sizing. So, and I don't like compressing stuff because then it sounds like shit. So I'll probably do that and stuff will be available on Patreon tomorrow. So then the early access will begin for episodes. And then from that point, It'll usually be two to three days after we'll get the normal release. So it's going to be a while before we get back to a normal release schedule, I think, just because now on top of Hobby Expo and all the SOR stuff that has to happen with that, I also have to move. And then there's snow and all that fun stuff. So when are you moving? I've, as soon as I can get keys, really. I mean, well, let me know so I can make plans to uh, be busy that weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good. I actually, thankfully, I have a lot of people willing to help uh, with the move that day. So I think we're trying. I don't. It sounds like we're going to try and start on Sunday because there's some. I'm still trying to work this out just because of getting down there and everything. But we're still trying to figure out when we can actually get keys because they told us that they can get keys as soon as they have some documents from us. But then we also got an email saying we can't get keys till the 19th. So oh. we'll see. So I, I just. That that can be solved with a simple phone call. So yeah, yeah, that'll be cool. I'm excited to get the move done. I it's gonna be nice for Hobby Expo because, well, then I don't have to drive all the way back to Camino every night. <laughs> so that's a huge plus. Yeah, you might be sleeping on a mat air mattress, but better than driving yeah. all the way. More like the floor, but we've done that before. <laughs> uh, we've done that at races many times. Yeah, I'm pretty sure for the first three years of traveling to NCTs, I was the uh, designated uh, floor sleeper in the, in the uh, hotels. <laughs> I generally didn't get a vote. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so let's see. What do we want to start with? Um, well, it's it's a new year, which we touched on in the last episode, right? New year, new track walk. And... You know what happens is every year, every year is supposed to be everyone's, this is going to be a great year, you know? Like, everyone wants to talk about how this year is going to be better than the last, and, well, I mean, they're looking forward to a lot of things, which is awesome. However, 
what I see is a lot of like repetitiveness, you know, it's kind of that one thing where people insist on being a part of the mold. They want to be, well, they want to be like every other racer. They want to be like all the fast racers. They want to, you know, race the latest and greatest. They want to, you know, switch to this brand because it's better. And the next year they'll switch to that brand and which we'll, 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 we'll talk about later. We'll talk about all that later, but, um, with this being a new year, right? This is already starting to happen. We saw a lot of switches, um, not a lot in the Northwest, but nationally. I mean, we had actually, I feel like some pretty surprise, surprise switches, both nationally, internationally, um, you know, and we, we talked about like the one year challenges, uh, we've never talked about on the podcast before, but I saw this term the other day that really stuck that RC is kind of like the one year challenge. People want to try different things. Uh, they always try different cars without really changing anything about themselves. Now I have to ask, right. And I I'm asking you as a listener, right. What is it about the RC community everywhere? Right. You have your, your culture of your pro guys that we look up to and, uh, new releases, things like that. And everyone kind of gravitates towards that. Everyone is sort of, I, I hate to get all Alex Jones and shit on people, but like, he, he, it, it's really like the sheeple thing. Everyone wants, to, everyone wants to be part of that mold. Hey, that's my term. Yeah. R- RC it's, racers it's, are sheep. A bunch yeah. of followers. Yeah. It's, it's the follower. It's the follower mindset. Yep. Nobody wants to do anything different. Very few. So what does it take to break out of the mold? What is what is it that racers aren't doing to set themselves apart from other racers? Like why why do we keep getting just this repeat action of people coming into the hobby, getting out of the hobby, but all these different people coming in at different times are doing the exact same thing? You guys are stuck in a cycle. The whole industry is stuck in a cycle because people refuse to adapt to change because people are, well, it's okay. There's two sides to that. One, people refuse to adapt to change, right? You want a case in point? Look at Roar. I'll go at Roar every time. And then (laughs) the second thing is people refuse to initiate that change because what, what is it? Maybe fear. Or you just lack the initiative in general, which is fine. That's not supposed to be a slight at people. Not everyone's going to innovate. But why is it that makes people so afraid to be different? I don't understand it. I have I have a, a what could be a small explanation for some of that. A lot of RC racers don't really know how to set up cars. Uh, they don't know racecraft. They don't know all this stuff. So they they want to do what other people are doing and seeing how fast they are and this kind of stuff. So they they assume that that's the only fast way around the track is to do what these fast racers are doing and just copying everything they do. And I think yeah. I think that's a big part of it is is the people in RC really. A lot, a lot of people don't fully understand how this all works. And, you know, learning setup is, is a, a huge part of that. Where most people want to look at a setup sheet and put on a setup and, and go because, I don't know, whoever may feel just one with this setup or Tebow or whatever. And they're just going to copy that because it's obviously fast. Right. And then when it turns out to be not not a great setup for them or it doesn't work for them they blame the car and then they go on to the next manufacturer who has cavalry driving the car oh he's, he just won the last race he's got to be he's got to be better than mayfield oh, he, he beat me mayfield at that race so my car's junk i got to go to the to the next one and copy his setup and when they can't drive that then they're looking for the next fast thing. So I think that's a big part of it. People just need to learn how all this works. And don't be afraid to step out and do something different. Yeah, I, I completely agree. 
Uh, the the best way to learn is trial through trial through error. Yeah, you're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna do things that you're gonna look in retrospect and say, "Wow, I really shouldn't have done that." Um, whether that become you know whether, whether that is in reference to setup, whether that's in reference to sponsors, and what. I need people to understand is that sometimes it is perfectly okay to make those mistakes because RC is one of those things where I mean pick any discipline in RC. This is this is beyond just off road. This applies to on road drag racing, uh, arrow boats, anything. There is so much to know, and you can't know it all. And the only thing that you have control over is your learning curve. There are some people, right, who ability-wise are are more naturally gifted than others. There are some people that can put in a lot of work, a lot of time, and might not be as fast as someone who is just ridiculously talented but puts a quarter of the work in, right? I mean that that there is there is a real uh, real gap, right? But that doesn't mean that's the end all for what your your ceiling is with a radio. It really it really doesn't. The the thing that I always tell people is that the best way to learn is to just learn themselves. Learn as much as you can on your own. Try things that work for you. There's nothing that's there's nothing wrong with asking questions, trying setup recommendations and stuff like that, but ultimately you're not going to find somebody that solves it for you. No. You're not going to find a sheet that solves it for you. And it doesn't matter how good of a racer you are. I experienced this just at the last race, actually, at the last iHeart race. I had this exact experience that I'm referring to. And I know that if you are a, whether you're an up and comer, a seasoned fast guy in the Northwest, or uh, just a, a sportsman racer trying to figure out, or even a complete novice, I don't know how many actual novices listen to the show, which, like, message me if you do, because I want to know. It doesn't matter the caliber of driver you are. You have that potential to learn. And you always have the potential to benefit from those things. You're never too good for it. The, the, I think one of the big things that people don't talk about, about like pro drivers and drivers that are particularly quick is because they lack, they lack the fear of it might not work. They are willing to put it on the line to try something. They're willing to find any way possible to get that competitive edge, to get them that extra couple tenths, to get them a more consistent run. Like they're they're and whether we talk setup, we talk mentally, right? And sometimes you can have all your ducks in a row and you're still gonna mess up. And the biggest thing you can do for yourself at that point is to just not give up. So I I talk about this a lot. I talk about the mental game of RC. I talk about uh, how much it matters to have, you know, attrition to be able to really endure. Because RC, whether it's a five minute race or five minute qualifier or a 30 to 45 minute nitro main, like it is taxing on the brain. It is hard. And it is especially hard if you are not conditioned to that kind of focus for that long. Like, what, what do you do in your day job? Like, you know, think about what you do during the day and what that requires of you, right? We want to. We don't want to get in too much into the mental side of it during this segment. Not yet. We well, got, we got that coming up a little later. Well, I mean, yes, <clears throat> that is true. <laughs> the mental side's but, huge. But the mental side is huge. We'll, which we'll get we, deeper into that here in a bit. Yeah, um, yeah, that might that might end up being a, a uh, RCU topic. Yeah, but that that it, yeah. So we'll talk about that when that time comes. Uh, we're going to bring on Elliot Chappelle for a question he has that should benefit a lot of you guys, and then we're going to talk about that with him because this is something he can relate to, and I know that he's in a lot of position or a lot of the same positions that a lot of you guys are listening to this. Right. So if we're going to talk physically, right, we're going to talk about your car. Um, You have to be willing to 
initiate change. You have to be willing to set yourself apart. Now, what's a good example of this, right? If let's say that there's there's a possibility you have no idea what I'm talking about. You have no idea how to tie this into what you what your race day program is or what your program is between races, um, between rounds. Take, uh, for example, that I, I, I'm I'm an associated driver. We have a large associated contingent at Die Hard, and there are always fast setups from fast associated pro drivers from relatively similar surfaces, but we always kind of adapt them to fit Die Hard, right? And this can be said for uh, your local dirt track, too. Uh, when I raced for HB, this was the case all the time where there was always like a fast setup from a pro or a uh, a local fast guy somewhere else in the country for similar conditions that I was in, right? And sometimes that doesn't work for you. Sometimes that doesn't mean anything, whether it, it doesn't matter who that setup sheet came from. Uh, there's a really solid chance you're going to drive very differently from them. and what a lot of people do is they try and just drive around it. They put a setup on it and they'd be like, they either convince themselves that it's good, right? It's the, the placebo effect, right? Where you, you, you automatically think it's going to be so good. You have yourself convinced before you even try it. And, um, you trick your mind into thinking it's working or you don't like it. And you just conclude that the car is shit and you move on. That happens a lot. A lot of people do that. Now, set up, is a complicated thing in itself, but for individual change, setup is really simple, right? Most of the time, it's just leverage. It's just leverage. It's in the cause and effect. Think about what something might do, try it, and see if it did what you think it did. That's all you have to do. And you know, the, right? key, the key to that is writing down what you did and what it did to the car. Yeah, you need to track it. You need to write it, it. You down. Need to take so you, notes. you can go back and look at it. And say, oh, okay, this made it made it really feel lazy and, and didn't have a lot of steering. So when you get to a track or a situation where you've got fresh tires on, you want to go back to that setup, to that change that you made to tone the car down. Or vice versa, if you want it more aggressive, then you know what to do to make it more aggressive. And that's, that's something that a lot of people miss. And I have a lot of people coming to me every race day and asking, you know, I need more steering or... Or, it, you know, the, the rear end's not hooked up or something. And, well, I can't just automatically bring something out of my out of my head to fix that problem automatically. I need to know more, and I need to know what changes you've made and what tires you're running and all this kind of stuff. And then um, even after all of that, I, I still I put the same setup on some people's cars and... And without watching the car, they'll come to me and and say, oh, it, it's not doing this or it's not doing that. And then I go out and, and watch them run the car. And like they'll go into a corner way too hard and it's pushing. Well, it, that's not the car. That's your driving style. <laughs> you gotta, yeah. you got to learn to drive the cars, let off at the right points, all this kind of stuff. There's more to it than just the car setup. You're not going to be able to hold the throttle, full throttle, all the way around the track. That's even with the best setup, it, it's, there's, there's certain things where you can fix and certain things you can't. So it all comes down to putting it all together as a package, your driving and the car setup. Yeah. Most times a car that feels good to you might not feel good to someone, someone else. Uh, right. This, this happens a lot. You hand off a radio yep. and you either think either, wow, this is really good or man, I don't know how you drive this thing. That's, that's like my setup. So I always give my setups to, to our drivers and anybody buying a car, you know, a new serpent car, I'll give them my setup and put it on. And a lot of the times our, our team drivers even will come to me after putting that on and say, oh, it's got too much rear grip and it's pushy or it feels real lazy and this kind of stuff. And okay, well then we need to make adjustments for your driving style. Well, for me, I'm old. So I like a car that's kind of lazy and, and it's just hooked up in the rear and it's so easy to drive. And people think that that can't be fast. Well, these guys aren't really beating 
<laughs> even <laughs> even when they change the setup for me. So it, there's there's so much to it where you have to think about uh, you know the overall race time, not just your individual lap times and and this kind of stuff. If you're crashing more because the car is more aggressive, it might turn down turn a, a faster lap time, but your overall race time is is not uh, going to be there in the end. So there's a, there's a happy medium, and I've finally realized that a lazy, kind of forgiving car is is faster for me. Yeah. See, and your driving style allows that. Yeah. Right? I know mine doesn't. I know a lot of people, we would drive that car and not not even remotely agree on the setup. Right. And that's just how it is. Right? That's not indicative of... Uh, this car being this or that, or I mean, it's just driving style. Like, look, we, we think about how much variable. Think about how much variable there is from person to person and ability, uh, and things beyond our seat. Take for example, um, well, you can make the pro athlete comparison. You can make the the full size uh, driver comparison. There's there's a lot of people that are just kind of bad at those things. And at the same time, there's there's a lot of people that are just really, really, really good, and they make a living do it, and that's their career, that's their livelihood, right? It doesn't mean that the guy who's who's bad at it should stop doing it, or the guy that's bad at it um, you know, can't ha- share that same livelihood. He's probably just not making money doing it, right? But he's still going out, he's still having fun, Right, and I'm not saying like I'm not implying that some of you are just bad drivers. What I'm saying is that there's there's variable and ability in everything we do beyond our C. So you can reasonably assume that people are going to drive our C cars very differently, and that goes beyond just some being able to get around the track quicker than others. There are some people I've seen it at Diehard. There are some people who run badass lines in some of the lower classes who run really just clean and consistent races that are turning lap times well are turning real race times i guess you know whole run times um that are really slow that they're they, they've got the consistency down they've got the attrition down they're just not that quick you know they just they just don't have a lot of speed and that's okay right I think that's a lot better place to be than the opposite where you're fast as shit and can't stop crashing. That's exactly uh, where, where you need to start. Exactly. Yeah. As soon as, when you're doing consistent race times and you're not, not crashing, then it's time to make your car a little faster. Yeah. Not the other way look around. At, yeah, look at your run time. See how close they are to each other if you go out like in between quals. Right. Granted, there there is some variable to that with like track conditions and everything, but you you are able to see pretty easily in times where you made mistakes. Um, I can look at a lap time and know if I blew a corner, right? Like I, I can look at that and know, and it, it doesn't make me special. It just means that I've studied it enough to know why a lap time differs this much than the time before it and after it, right? Cause you can reasonably assume that you crashed or you blew a line or, uh, you made a, a bad, you know, zig and zag decision somewhere. It, it just happens. So It's just one of those things where you aren't going to find someone to fix it for you, right? No setup sheet's going to fix it for you. You got to learn to try things yourself because you're going to find yourself in a bind where you have all of the latest and greatest. You have the most current setup sheet. You have all this team support around you, and you still might think that the car is not good enough. Um, But then you need need the hop-up parts. You got to add all the hop-up parts at that point. Well, I I was implying they already had them, (laughs) but you're, you're absolutely right. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, then buy the hop ups. Oh yeah, but <laughs> we're checking right now. <laughs> don't don't but, buy all the hop ups right away. You don't need. <laughs> but point being is that you've got to be willing to potentially sacrifice a run or two to know if the car is better or not. And there is absolutely no shame in failing. Right, you cannot be afraid to fail. You're going to, regardless if you if you go out and do that or not, you're going to fail. And you know what? The take that you should be applying to yourself is that if you don't go out and try those things, you've already failed. You're failing I, yourself. You got to know what these changes do. 
Don't don't, don't yeah. go off someone else's word because their driving style could be completely different. And you know, th- and there's something to be said about like what we do too, right? Obviously, in case you haven't figured out, we have a podcast. We talk about these things, and we on occasion do talk about like setup advice and things like that, and in reference to certain changes, whether someone asked or something that we felt we wanted to talk about on our own. And there are instances where you might try something we recommend and you might completely hate it. And that's that's just part of the game. It doesn't mean that we gave you a bad suggestion. It just means that it didn't work for you. That is so common. Even, you know, I mean, the tires are a great example of this, right? Yep. So, you know, consider that. Uh, and that's really kind of the big spiel I had is that this is... Uh, this is something that a lot of racers need to work on. This is if I could give like anybody like blanket advice uh, all in one go. This is the most important thing I think you need to work on um, besides mental toughness, which we'll talk about later. Yeah, you know, I, I've thrown many races, not intentionally, but, um, you know, making setup changes where I really didn't know what it was going to do, but I gambled on it and, you know, a tire change or a a link position or a shock oil and and you just have to accept that it may just end up being a throwaway run but at least you've learned and you need to go back and write that down to what it did in the conditions that you were running it and it will be a learning experience so it's not a loss you have another race coming up if, if later in the day or next week or whatever it's a learning experience and we've all gone through it. And that's how the fast guys get fast is to try stuff and occasionally have a bad race because what they tried didn't work. That's just how it is. That's how you learn. That's how you get fast. Totally. Yeah. So we talked last week about how, you know, we have a lot of things to look forward to this year. We talked about the things that really excite us. So what do you think racers in particular, you know, I guess beyond us or like, you know, grassroots racers, sportsman racers, stuff like that. What do you think they should be excited about this year in the Northwest? What do you think really stands out to them that, um, that, or that maybe isn't quite as obvious that should make them excited? Uh, that we have some of the most badass racing going on in the whole country, right here in the Northwest. I think that's the biggest thing where, you know, people want to bitch and moan about this race or this layout or whatever. But we do have the some of the best racing in the whole country, right here in the Northwest, with Die Hard, with Burlington, with the NCTs, with, you know, TRCR, with uh, the tracks in, in Oregon and Portland and, and all over, you know, there's there's big things happening out in Boise, that lots of big things happening, and I think that's what there is to be excited about. There's lots of big races coming up during the year. Uh, yeah, it's just it's an exciting exciting time here in the Northwest for RC. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I I want people to go out and try a lot of new things this year. I want them. I want some of the diehard racers to make it up to Skagit, and I want some of the north north end guys to come down to Die Hard. I mean, I want I want people to really expand their comfort zones this year, um, because we have a great scene here, and people should take advantage of that. I think what we do is badass, and um, I think the best part about the Northwest is that we have so many things we can do at any given point. Think about the summer, right? We can go race Skagit on the weekends, die hard during the week, and die hard on some of the off weekends from Skagit. I mean, that's pretty sweet, right? We always have that or, available to us. Or is it, is it Skagit on the off weekends of die hard? Which is it? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it, luckily, they they typically work together on their schedule, so it's uh, it's fairly easy to go do both, which is nice. Yeah, I think there was only one race that conflicted last year, which was due to a wedding scheduling date. So understandable. It happens. So yeah, that's there's there's also life that surrounds RC, and I can understand how that inhibits a lot of people. I think there's a, there's something to be said for that too. Trust me, I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> so. That's just how it goes. Um, 
yeah, what uh, what else did we want to touch on before I got into some of the questions here? Well, we were we gonna... kind of a light episode this week because it came out of nowhere. So you know, as part of that whole thing, you know, setting yourself apart from others. Um, you know, and you know, instead of being a sheeple, and we've kind of we've we've talked about that, but there's also other things. You know, the social media side of it, getting involved with helping other racers, part of it, that kind of thing will help set you apart as well. And it sets you apart in the face of sponsors, potential sponsors. Um, and w- you know, actually working with, with somebody else, you know, a, either a, a, a newer driver or a, a more experienced driver it goes both ways. Both people are going to learn from that situation. You're going to learn from a, from a newer driver. You're, you know, helping them out with setup or, or driving lines and this sort of thing. You're going to learn by watching them and by helping them and working on their cars, all this kind of stuff. It, that's going to set you apart. That's going to help you be a better racer. It's going to help you be a better person, which uh, a lot of us, myself included, need to work on. And that's, you know, you want to set yourself apart, then that's, that's how to do it. And the social media thing right now is, uh, is a big deal. A lot of sponsors are looking at that and, you know, if you want to help other people post up your tips and your setups and, and your race reports and all this kind of stuff, and that will help set you apart. I completely agree. I, you know, what's been cool for me is, uh, since I've kind of gotten back into this, there's been such a new influx of racers at Die Hard that I've kind of been able to take on a bit of like a, a mentor role for like some of the kids. I always do really well with the kids in racing. Um, and that's been really fun for me. And it's also been really motivating for me because it's sort of reinvigorated that focus. And it, I think at the end of all of this, um, you know, once whoever I end up helping out through whatever the next, like <laughs> several years and they all end up being faster than me. Um, I think I'm going to be a lot more knowledgeable by the end of it. And I think I'll be a lot better at all this too, because I, I, it's a two way street, like you said, and, uh, you have that ability to learn 24 seven and you should be able to take advantage of that. And, and this doesn't, if you're a fast person listening to this, like you, you are like objectively good. Um, and I know a lot of people think that right of themselves and that's just how it goes. But if you, if you honestly sit there and look at yourself and think that you are objectively good at driving an RC car at racing and you, you consistently place well, then you, you, should consider what you can do to give back, right? Uh, because I can promise you that this this hobby and this industry has given already so much more to you than you've given it, right? Yeah. Give back a little. Help your community. Uh, there's so many ways you can do that. I mean, um, I mean, shit, Colin and I started a podcast for our, 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 regional, our regional racing scene. There's not another podcast anywhere that does what we do. And I'm not saying we're better than pod- other podcasts. I'm just saying, like, think about the the true reach of what we do. It's not that much as we do it for the people we see every weekend, whether that be Die Hard or at Nitro Races. It doesn't matter. You know, that's what we do to try and help, to try and bring exposure, right? I'm not saying you have to go out and start a podcast. I'm saying, like, do just check on check on novices, check on sportsman racers. I mean, just... Just kind of, you know, take a lap around the pits every once in a while to see if people are struggling with stuff. Watch people's runs. See if you can offer help. Don't be a douche about it because there's a lot to be said about that. Don't, like, don't make your input the end all. Like, Travis, you had such a terrible run. What's wrong with you? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Hey, man, that run was kind of dog shit. Like, you know what? You should (laughs) watch me next time. (laughs) Uh, And see, that comes to another point. Stop thinking that you're, you're God's gift. Yeah. That's a big problem. You know, I'm okay. There's a segment that's going to be aired for the first time this week at the end of this episode, which is called let it out, (laughs) which is going to be a nice way for Colin and I to get the stuff that, uh, is a little more controversial. And, uh, but it's still okay for the podcast controversial, um, out. And yeah, I, I, 
I'm going to put some disclaimers at the beginning of that, but I highly recommend listening to it. And that's going to be part of what we talk about today. Um, because I, it's just, dude, we race RC cars and that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so, cause I mean, like, look, Colin and I fuck up all the time. Right. <laughs> dude, we, oh, we yeah. are constantly making mistakes. Don't think that we aren't. And don't think that we don't think that we are. You should have. So I'll, I'll have a hold my hands up moment real fast. At the last Die Hard race, I went out in Q2. Tyler made a bunch of setup changes on my car because I was just, I was lost, right? I was trying to figure out what I was doing. And I, I had made a really shit gear decision, a gearing decision on my car, which had played into a lot of my setup issues, something I never would have expected. Um, and uh, I we, we got that fixed before the main, but we made all these setup changes and we put it out and uh, we had both forgot to set the camber on the rear of my car. So I shit you not, I'm go- I'm going out in this Q2 run. The car is so locked in, but the rear end looks broken. I'm like, dude, what is going on? I asked like someone, I was like, dude, can you, can you just look at the rear end real fast? And uh, they just throw it down. They're just like, run it. Come to find out. I measured it out to like, I had like negative eight degrees of camber. <laughs> on either wheel in the rear. My 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 team manager walks over, looks at my car, and just shakes his head. <laughs> like, imagine how I felt in this moment, right? Like how stupid I felt that like I checked my ride height, everything looked great, and I didn't even think to change, like look at my rear camber after we made a camber, like a camber link hole change, right? Like just one of the simplest things that you should check for every run that I'm constantly telling people they should check for, and I just had a total space cadet moment and missed it. And, like, I'm driving as hard as I can, and I can only manage, like, a 14th overall. Like, I just, I completely shit the bed. And so I get that fix, and I'm sitting here thinking, like, all right, well, like, I'm still having a little bit. Like, I I know that, obviously, my camera was messed up, but I knew there were some things going on. Come to find out, I made a really bad gear decision when I put that motor in. I geared it for a 5.5 instead of the 6.5 that was in it. I don't, I, I... the five fives in my four wheel. Like I don't know what convinced me that I had a, a six. I, I you you take the body off and you can see it, right? Like that's how dumb this was. I geared it down two teeth because I I I was pushing. The car felt super lazy, and I was just like I was trying to get everything I could out of the car. I geared it down two teeth, and my mid major speed was high enough that I could actually let off and off power rotate in the corners, and my car was perfect after that. And I wasted a whole race day. On I, almost a whole race day up to the mains. The mains went well, but I raced it every moment up to that on all of this bullshit because I made a bad gearing decision because I just didn't double check that. I didn't double check what motor I had. Like, dude, we're guilty of it all the time. We do those things. I do. I do those things constantly. It happens. And this is going to play into what I talked about earlier. Like, dude, be afraid to make mistakes. Even if you just had a dumbass moment. Like, where you just did something so unbelievably stupid. You know what? You learn from those. Yeah, it's embarrassing, sure. It's embarrassing for me when I have a car that, you know, looks like it just came from Stance Wars. (laughs) Like, (laughs) you think that was a fun moment for me? No. And I have a podcast telling people what I think? (laughs) You know, like, (laughs) you know, think about it. We're not perfect. No, not at all. And we're not ever trying to indicate that. Like, trust me, it's... We know where we stand. (laughs) (laughs) We always know. Until we start winning those mod races. Then we can... Then we can start getting on our throne. But... Until then. We're... we're, That's... We're still... That's what Nitro Season's for. (laughs) 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 Oh, is is it Nitro Season? Oh, wait, let me look out the window. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, not quite. Still, still coming down. Oh, I can. I am ready for some Skagit Club racing this year. I cannot rate for Nitro. Yeah, yeah. You've got a whole new program this year for Nitro. It's gonna be. Uh, it's always exciting to have a new program like that. Yeah. Even I, even I'm when really curious. Even when you were happy with your old program, something changes and you got a new program coming up. It's always exciting to try a new car. I. I That's the totally best feeling. That. Yeah, that's the best feeling, too, and it's really reassuring when you know you left a good car. Yeah. 
And um, and there were times where, like, the last car I had when I raced for HB, like, there were times where I really struggled with those those platforms. And, and kind of through trial and error, I was able to figure out what I like, what I don't like, and not being afraid to make changes. I mean, I, I really only had that renaissance within the last year. Um, leading up to the little bit of nitro racing that I did before that, I was super timid with setup change. And I would, I, I went the, you know, safe and lazy route on my cars because I was afraid of, you know, making a bad setup change in the car, not, you know, being too hard to drive. And finally, one day I completely replaced the rear end on my car. Like I, I changed shock towers, shock bodies, different like shock shafts, springs, like everything on the rear end of my car, uh, different chassis brace locations. And the thing was money. And I'm just like, sweet. Like, so I wasted a year and a half, like just not like just being afraid. Right. And so like leaving the HB program last year, like I knew the cars like had a lot of potential and I learned a lot of things, which means that like going into this year where obviously the car's proven, I'm excited to see how I adapt to it and the, all the, the new things I get to learn this year, you know, transitioning to a pillow ball car. I've never owned a pillow ball car. So that's going to be cool. Like I'm super excited to like just feel how it drives and how different it is from what I had before. I'm, I'm excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. It, it's, it can also be scary switching from a platform that you are comfortable with, you know is good, it's, know it's fast, to something you haven't driven before. That's also... It's exciting, but it can also be scary. Yeah, normally I would, yeah, normally I would, like, recommend, like, if you are going to switch, like, go to something you know, but, uh, like, I was familiar with the the 10 scale line from Associated, but the 8 scale was kind of been unbeknownst to me, so that was, yeah, I mean, that, you're absolutely right, like, it is also scary, like, because I think it's more, I don't know if it's, like, it's scary as much as it is like just a little, you know, a little bit of like anxiety inducing just because like you are just really unsure of like what your first impression is going to be. And you're like, you're still kind of waiting to see what your like initial feel of the car is and where you need to go from there. I think that first run always on a new car is always super scary, whether you're familiar with it or not. And then new cars take time to break in. Especially an eight, that eight scale. So your first couple runs could be nothing like what the car is actually going to be, even though you're going to make no changes to it. It'll yeah. it'll break in and get better. Like I know our, our SRX eights take probably a gallon to fully break in before they're yeah. really fast. So people put their car down for the first time. It's like, oh, I can barely drive this. What have I done? Well, give it some time and let it break in and, and then start making adjustments to it. It just takes time. You know, it's, you can't just set a car down and expect it to be fast. That's just not how it goes. hundred percent. Yeah. Pl- I completely pl- agree. Plus you got to add all the hop ups. You got to have the hop ups, Travis. Yeah. You're brass nuts. We talked about that earlier. <laughs> I love my brass nuts. <laughs> uh, so, I think it's a good time for a break before we call Elliot. What do you think? I, I'm down. I'm going to go get another beer. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. All right. Well, we will be back in just a couple moments, and we will start off with our RC University segment presented by Die Hard RC with Elliot Chappelle. So we'll be back in a few. <laughs>
Alright, so welcome to Die Hard RC Presents RC University. This week we are joined by a special guest from RC University, Elliot Chappelle. Elliot, how you doing? Not too bad. How are you guys doing today? Doing well. You enjoying the snow? Not really. I'm bored. I'm going to go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Uh, I think you're the only kid ever that has ever said that. <laughs> Well, it's our think, second day of it. Yeah. I don't yeah. think Colin and I, or well, either of us, were upset for our snow day, so. No, not, not complaining too much. Not, <laughs> I'm, I'm complaining I don't have an RC to go around in the snow, though. Yeah. Get yourself a crawler. Well, we, we've <laughs> talked about that. I, I need to if keep getting snow. For real. There you go. <laughs> You've finally, finally been sold on one. Yeah. Alright, so Elliot is joining us this week with a question, which will be our, well, no, our topic of conversation for the RCU segment. So, Elliot, what you got for us? So, my question is, um, where would you draw the line between upgrading a RC car to its fullest potential so that you can learn with the best car, and also just not upgrading it and just learning racecraft and finding your lines with a decent enough car? Okay. Like at one point, should you stop investing in the bling or chasing the hundredth of a second? And just focus on not crashing. Exactly. Um, Colin, do you want to start that one off? Yeah, I think you've almost answered the question yourself, Elliot. By uh, when you say uh, focusing on not crashing, when you can do a complete run without uh, without really crashing much, then I think it's time to start worrying about going faster. Uh, aside yeah, from durabil- durability upgrades, sure, you, you, you probably want to do that when you're crashing a lot anyway, but as far as go fast parts, once you can get around the track, I, I think then is the time when upgrade parts are, are probably the next step. Right on. Travis, what do you have to add to that? Yeah, my answer to that is <laughs> instantly, you should just stop. Um, I mean, there's really no point to go that way. I mean, you can make, obviously having a car that's blown out and isn't, you know, as fresh as it could be or have all the, you know, the cool stuff the fast guys are running. I, I understand that. And I understand that, like, you know, you want to have that stuff, but it, it really doesn't help you. It doesn't help you learn. Uh, I mean, it's just one of those things where uh, you really just need to focus on your driver ability for as long as you can. I mean, you, you get a sweet spot for when you know that you can start making changes like that where you get um, different parts that will do different things. But most of the time, I mean, regardless of all that, the car is going to get its direct input from you as a driver. Um, you need to learn how to to get the most out of that input to make smart decisions driving the car. That's, uh, that's really just what it comes down to. Um, I, I mean, the, the, the topic of conversation on hop ups, this and that, I mean, it just, it, you really should never think of that. I mean, honestly, in like your first, like one to two years racing, I mean, there's no point in going for the bling. There really isn't. Unless you've got the money and you just want it to be blinged out, then. Yeah, spend, but spend the money. But I think there's better things to spend money on at that point. Tires, more track yeah. time. I mean, you can't. I don't think you can buy speed, really. I mean, no, at least I, at our level. I checked, yeah. and they're sold out. <laughs> yeah, sold sold out on speed. <laughs> sold out of speed. <laughs> uh, that's something where you got to make your own speed. Yep. Make that a, make that yourself. You got a recipe I can use. I do. I do. Hang out for a while, and, and I'll tell you how to make some speed. There we go. <laughs> it's a trap. He's going to give you a serpent. <laughs> I said I wanted speed. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> it's going to be like that, huh, Elliot? <laughs> <laughs> All right. When, when you start beating me, then I'll I'll take that into consideration. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, I think just track time and, and learning how to drive. You know, all the cars now are are really very good without any hop ups. So get out there and drive and, and make sure your maintenance is up to date. And I know Elliot, you do a lot of maintenance, so you're you keep your stuff in pretty good shape. But you know, worn out, you know, when your arms get sloppy and all that yeah. kind of stuff, that's more important than adding, you know, these little hop ups and blingy parts all over the car. And keep it in, in good mechanical shape and learn how to drive it. And then the speed will come. It'll come automatically. You, you can't really force it. When you force it, you end up crashing. Do that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing. I think just learn how to work on your stuff. That'll take you so much farther. If you're looking for like a material, a material go fast kind of tip, work on your, work on your stuff. I mean, really, like, even if you, the, the the biggest thing you can do is when it's preventative, when you're not doing it because you broke it, it's just doing it like, you know, refreshing oils, putting new O-rings in, um, replacing output shafts, drive shafts, bearings. I mean, it, it, and sometimes you don't even need to do that. I'm not saying do, do it every time. Um, I'm saying, like, just check for those things. Ship your I- car down, find out what's good, what isn't. Totally agree. I think when you work on your own car, you understand it better. Yeah. And you know what? When The more you do that, then the more motivated you are at races to maintain your car between rounds. Because you have the time, right? But you sit, you, you sit there stressing yourself out for half of the time that you have to work on it. Just stressing yourself out of like working on it because it, you feel like it's this big endeavor. Um, and you keep doing this and suddenly you'll find yourself in a position where you can... You can rebuild that thing between rounds, no problem, man. Like it's just, it, it's just, it comes with practice, just like, just like actual driving. It comes with practice. It comes with repetition. You just gotta do it. That's the hardest part. Seems legit. Yeah, I, I think that that's a, I think that's, that should just be the direction I think everyone should go. Yep. So, Elliot. What do you think? You want to hang out for some listener questions? Y'all probably look around. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. All right, so we got them in a couple places. Um, we'll go off the Die Hard RC Racers page first, that where I posted it. Um, if you asked a question and I didn't answer it, it's because I posted the question an hour before. Well, not even an hour. <laughs> I post. I posted the question fifteen minutes before we started recording. And pretty much about an hour, hour and a half before this moment. So, <laughs> sorry. I apologize. I'll try and get you next week. Um, so, first question is from Colin Taylor. Hello to Colin. Um, when are you good enough to leave novice and where should you go? For instance, in my case, I could, I think, join the 40 plus, cap, 40 plus class excuse me, and slash or join the two-wheel drive stock buggy. But is there an expected level of competence... And how do you know that you're there? Um, I think 21.5 would be the first step out of novice. That's the whole intention of that class. Yeah, well, he 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 is in novice already. I mean, I'm sorry, not novice. Uh, 21.5 already. Oh, okay. I think so. I think that to sum up his question, I think is just how do you know you're ready to move up, uh, regardless of level? I think. Um. Well, okay. So someone. Someone did reply to that. That was kind of just like, well, well, when you when you TQ and win every race, um, I, I guess that was Mike's question. Mike a- asked a similar question: when you should leave any class? Yeah. Um, I mean, which is a, it's a good answer. Um, you know, when you TQ and win every race, but you know what? There are some instances where uh, this is this is a little rare, but for some people, this works really well. I know this was probably the best thing I ever did was. Um, get yourself out of those classes early and try and learn with the fast dudes. Um, like I, like I, for example, my journey was I never raced novice. So like the first race that I went to, there was no novice class. So I had to race two wheel short course. And, um, in this big event in Oregon, suddenly I was qualifying like top five with my slash. And so from that point on, when I went to a track that had novice, my dad was like, no, you, I mean, you can't run that. Like, <laughs> doesn't make any sense. So, as racing, I just I jumped right into two wheel short course, and 
even with the car I had at the time, it was still, you know, we had a pretty good dual drive short course contingent at JNS back in the day. It was not uncommon for us to have a C main. So when we had that, it was, I was still being able to come out and pull like, you know, thirds and fourths and, you know, numerous top fives. The win eluded me for a while, but I think that progressed me so much further because I was just instantly racing with the guys that were better for, than me. Um, and it was just this trial by fire. I think some people, I think some people should do that. And it's really hard to know when you should. And I think the best thing you should do is just go out there and try it. One of these races, go race a different class. If you race 21, five, try racing 17, five, just randomly, whether you feel like you're ready or not, um, you might find it works. You might find that, Oh, this was a terrible decision. I should go back. But the point is you tried, um, novice if if you have a an obvious skill set for driving um you can get around a track okay you can re- like not crash a reasonable amount um if you are able to gather that from your first race then your second race go to 215 go to whatever the next class is from you don't need to race the full season and novice to be ready if you feel that you are at that point where you either a want to try it or be like you there's there is you think objective an objective opinion that you are well good enough at what you do to do something else like to go to a different class like move on up like you, you find the thing about rc and like people chase people like to chase wins a lot they chase competition we i'll touch on the sa- sandbagging question later um but Look, RC wins, I'm going to blow some minds real fast. RC wins are honestly pretty hollow. Once you've done no. it, once you've done it, the feel, I mean, don't don't get me wrong, it's a great thing. I think there's something to be said about like series championships, but wins individually are generally pretty hollow, like at least my in my experience, like once I've won a race, like I generally don't feel as excited as I thought I would have been. Cuz then I'm instantly my mindset is, well now I've got to do this again next race and you know what, like there's there's some pressure that comes with it. And I think with with if you're if you're going out and I've seen it time and time again, you go out and you dominate novice, you TQ and win every race, um, all you're doing is wasting time. You're wasting time for yourself, you're inhibiting your ability to learn. If you like because obviously you know you can do it and people know you can do it. There's no point running nine straight races in novice before you decide, Hey, this time next year, I'm going to move on to something else. Think about all the time you waste in between where all that time in the previous winter, like, yeah, it'd be hard, but you know what? You're going to learn way faster. You're going to get way better at what you do. You're going to learn a lot of uh, tips and tricks from people that are better than you. You're not going to go out and win. And it shouldn't be like that. So that's what I would say. Like, uh, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of that, all that, that answer should be, you know, that should work for Mike's question, too, of just, like, when should you move out? Um, I mean, the exact moment you feel like you're ready. And, like, look, there's nothing wrong with staying in a class forever. Some people might be career 21-5 racers. If they're winning TQ and winning every race, then I think that that's a bad thing. That's but a problem. That's a problem, 100%. Yeah. Elliot, uh, are, are you swimming or eating something? What is going on over there? I'm just walking around the drive with this whole snow. <laughs> You're making an awful lot of noise. Uh, all right, I'll sit down for you. <laughs> all right, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, if somebody's winning and TQing every single race, then it's time to move up. And that's, that's a big debate whether they need to be moved up, uh, by, by the race organizer or, if they should do it voluntarily, you know, at that point, I feel like it's, uh, it's trophy chasing. Yeah, I and completely Megan. agree. If we're going to talk about 21.5 in particular, um, yeah, if you're, if you're TQing, if you TQ and win more than, as much or more than a quarter to a third of the races in the season, yeah, you shouldn't be in the class. You're sandbagging. Yeah. So, um, you can, Look at the results from this past season, and you can kind of make that conclusion about what you think is happening. But yeah, that like that's you, you shouldn't be in the class. 
so that yeah that comes down to the program of honestly like trying to enforce that because it, it is obvious that 21.5 is supposed to be a stepping stone class and if there's people that aren't going to take advantage of that then um then the, that that goes into the hands of the program so right um, now we're we're talking about club racing we're not talking about going to these big jcon races where they have 21.5 or whatever no it, at a club race it is supposed to be a stepping stone class out of out of novice that was yeah. the intention yeah. So, if if you're winning all these races, then it's time for you to just move on up. Yes. Yeah. That's you know that's not the class for you. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. So, like I said, you can make your own conclusion on if you look at the results, uh, on if you think that's happening right now or not. Um, because I think a lot of these questions might be referencing that. So, um, yeah, just. Yeah, <laughs> listen to what we're saying and then look at the results and, you know, kind of draw a parallel, see if you think it fits. And from there, then you can have conversations with other people about that if you think that's an issue. But, um, I mean, back to the, the original question, like, uh, you, you set the standard for yourself. So think of, and like I said earlier in the show, way before we got onto this subject, you are directly responsible for your own learning curve. So um, take that into consideration. So, Mike could also ask, what about tech? Any good thoughts on tech implementation? I know there are things such as motor claim rules. Any thoughts? I love the motor claim rule. <clears throat> I think that would bring stock way back in line if the if the claim price was, uh, I don't know, around a uh, hundred bucks, one hundred and twenty, mm-hmm. hundred and twenty dollars, somewhere around there. I think that would. Uh, that would solve a lot of the hundred and seventy, two hundred dollar motor problems. I yeah, I I don't agree with it personally. I like the concept, but I think that take any part of RC racing, um, then apply this rule. I think you would end up with unprecedented amounts of bullshit between racers. Um, I just I and there would be all sorts of, um, well. All kinds of dumb things happening. I think that because um, there is it now. I well, that would just be opening the floodgates for just un like ridiculous amounts of tension. I right? don't think so. Like I don't think so. The amount of tension now amongst stock racers is through the roof. So <laughs> you know, and there's nothing yeah. you can do about it other than I, than I agree. Chrome. But at, if at least with a claim rule, you can do something about it. Yeah, but I think that that is a great way to immediately run off racers. I think that there's just no good that comes with it. It, it gets rid of the stock problem, but like I said, like it just, it, I, I think that that would just bring unprecedented amounts of bullshit. And like, I, as a racer like me, like there are people who want to race stock, and like for me, that would further incentivize to not even ever race the class. I sure as shit wouldn't race the class if I ever wanted to race stock, and that was the thing. And that 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 applies to the drag racing too like i I think that we should not even do that in the drag racing like it's just it's not we don't live in that kind of world in the rc industry where things like that make sense to me i i see this this new drag try it but this new drag racing thing the the whole no prep is where the it, it completely wipes out all the motor games and battery games for the most part because nobody's gonna, you can you can go out and buy whatever motor, and you know seventy, eighty, hundred dollar motor, and have more than enough power that you're not gonna be able to put it all down. So then there's no motor games. You're right about that. But what are people? I don't know if you've listened to like uh, Tim Smith's show yesterday or the one he put out this week. I was gonna listen to it today, but you said you wanted to record. So. <laughs> so- <laughs> The bullshit that's happening now in NPRC stuff is, or well, no, no prep, no prep in general, not just NPRC, um, is that now there's a tire game that's coming with it. People are putting tires down that are supposed to be dry that are so sticky that they're nearly tearing the carcasses. Well, that's because the same they have in, in any any form. Go go to the Reedy race and tell me that the fast guys aren't uh, doing something to their tires. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that. If you eliminate one thing, then you people are just going to move to something else. Right. So if you have a motor claim rule, people are just going to start doing other bullshit in stock. Like, it's just one of those things where it's just a cascading effect. 
until you get rid of all of it, then I there's what can you do? Because uh-huh. like look, let's be on let like let's be honest, let's clear the air real fast. Like stock is going to be stuck in this cycle for a while. Yeah. Stock is going to stay in a spot where it is just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse because of these motors that come out and the the condition of the racing. The racing is absolutely horrendous. This and I'm not talking about just stock at diehard. I'm talking about stock anywhere. The fast guys in stock race like ass. <laughs> like there's no racecraft, none at all. So like let's take even all the car stuff away about it. It's still some of the roughest racing around. And I well, understand that- there's a, I understand that that's going to piss a lot of people off because there's a big stock contingent at Die Hard. I get that. And look, 30 like the 30 to I would say 8, 70%. I know that's a big window, but this changes every race. From 30 to 70% of the racers, like I'm not talking to you. Right? But we've all we've talked about this several times. It's the, like the top contingent that push these rules that far. Right? The the fat and you know I, I think the original the 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 answer I should have of of had to Mike's question is what kind of condition is that class of racing in to where this is even a debate where we even have to have that conversation that speaks volumes to the state of that those classes and the problems that come with it. And why a class like 21.5 exists in the first place because those classes got so out of hand. So, look, I I like the... What I do like about the claim rules is that... Uh, yeah, it, you're right. It does eliminate the motor problem like you talked about exactly, Colin. You're 100% correct. But as a race... Like, if I was a race promoter and I was like Brett and Brenda... Uh, I would want to steer clear of that as far as possible because, like, to me, like, that just adds a whole other layer of shit. Because you know people are going to try and game the system. They're going to try and mess with it somehow. People always find a way because that's what people do. And that's why I think that is a very dangerous, slippery slope in RC. Because, like, and in, in if people are going to make the full-scale motorsports comparison like they always do, right? Where... Suddenly, we have an idea that we aren't implementing, but they do it in scale motorsports, which you ignore that and everything else. So thank you for being selective. But you're going to take that and like in, in, in full scale drag racing, those racers don't bullshit like that. There's too much money on the line. There's lives at stake. Yeah, but they get torn down in, in, in real motorsports, not real motorsports. Sorry. In full size motorsports. <clears throat> They'll tear down an engine. I was kart racing uh, for three or four years, you know, in my teens, and we had our engines torn down nearly every single race. And you know how fun that is going home with a box full of parts that was your engine? So, okay, so then let me ask you that. Should we start doing that to stock racers? Absolutely. Yeah. So... Then this brings me back to the original, I guess, the point that I should have made in all of this is where is stock to where we feel like this is necessary? It's exactly where it is, where this is necessary. Yeah. It's, there's there's a lot of stuff going on and the manufacturers are in on it. If people if people are going to use Roar as an actual baseline and follow Roar rules, then it, these races that are supposed to be spec classes... Where you know the, the spec classes, spec motors, and you know certain spec things about the car, like blinky stuff like that, then yeah, you know what? Why don't we have someone post up with a table, tear their motor apart right after a run, and measure everything? And once one of those guys gets told that their motor is illegal and they're disqualified, then maybe that'll go away. It would certainly cut down on a lot of. A lot of the shit that's going on at a lot yeah. of these races, for sure. Yeah, there has to be rules in a spec class. The spec class is all about rules. And you, you know what? This, this, okay. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. This, this brings me back to what I was talking about a little while, well, a little while ago. All right. And you remember all that shit that blew up with Phantom about how 
um, they had a certain motor disqualified from war because the uh, the wire gauge was too thick or something like that. Well, they weren't the first. I'm not saying they were. The point I'm making about that is that all these people were trying to defend them and all these other companies. I'm not just calling out Phantom, but Phantom was the most recent this happened to. I think it's absolutely hilarious when people try and defend these companies, how it's like, oh, well, it was a manufacturing mistake, oh, this or that. Like, how many of us understand in the world of living how tolerances work? The fact is, somewhere that was allowed. Somewhere that was open to interpretation. You're going to tell me that that was just a mistake that the, the, the factory in China made completely unbeknownst to you? There's no way that could have happened? There's just sit there and defend that like we don't know like that there's a tolerance for everything that nothing is ever made exact. And it just so happens that the tolerance was just just enough that it made it illegal. Come on. <laughs> well, that's the, the general reply and it was made illegal and banned and Trinity's gone through the same thing many times, which there's they still play games. There's still stuff going on. A lot of a lot of those companies them, do. A lot of those companies too, and that's my point in all of this. Is like, it, <laughs> I you know here's my okay. Here's the last thing I'm going to say before we move on to a different a different question is, what kind of satisfaction do you get participating in that and participating in the BS motor game and this and that about stock racing that has ultimately made the class no fun? What kind of satisfaction do you get from those wins? Like, are you like? Like, really that afraid to lose? It depends on the type of person you are, ultimately. Yeah. I just, I don't <laughs> That's understand That's the bottom it. line. I, under I understand mod isn't everyone's cup of tea, but there's something to be said about why a lot of people don't race it. That's why I run mod. I don't play, I don't have to play the motor game. I've got the same motor in my car I've had in it for over a year now. Mm. Same battery, same everything. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't need to replace all that stuff because it still has way too much power for my, my skill level. Yeah. But shit, people are out here with dinos and these motors that are, you know, you pick any random can and it just might be illegal. Like, come on. Like, I, I just, I don't understand what you get as a racer from satisfaction like that. Like, if I can win a mod race, if I can win a nitro race, right? If I could win an NCT championship and feel like there's still something left on the table and there's something to gain from all of it and to keep going and feel that competitive edge still there then how hollow must it feel for you when you go out and dominate every stock race because you are just submersed in that game? Like, what what are you gaining from RC at that point, then? You're just showing up to beat people's ass? Like, if that's your idea of fun, that's fine, but that, look what it's doing to the class. You know, it is the biggest class in the country. I will say that right now. And there's a reason for that. I don't understand the reason for it because I don't enjoy that game. But... A lot of people enjoy the game of tinkering with their cars and making them faster. And that's, you know, you can't take that away. The stock class is always going to be there. And it's people enjoy that kind of thing, obviously, by the, the numbers that they get at most tracks. Stock is usually larger than mod. You know, so, well, you know, what's funny about that is that, yeah, you tinkering on your car doing little things and this and that and adding all these things together to make the car just that much faster to look for any competitive edge is awesome i completely i i think that that's a great part of our seat but you can do it in every class you can do it in mod you can do it in eight scale racing right you can do it everywhere i agree so, so you know what what how i'm going to close this before i ask another question is i invite a stock racer i invite any stock racer to come on to the show, all right? I'll give you full guest spot and everything, and I want you guys to tell me why you race it and why you think it's fun and why we're wrong. I want to know because there's something I'm obviously missing. There's something that Colin's obviously missing. There's yep. something that a lot of the country seems to be missing. So hit me up, any of you. I'll You'll get your time of day on the show and debate us on it and, like, I think that'd be a lot of fun, but I want to know. Prove us wrong. It, I think it, it, it's fun for the tinkerers, but see, the, the problem is half of the, there's no there's no distinct ladder to get through and get to the highest level. Yeah, be, because we've got people that think 
21.5 and 17.5, and then mod is a skill-based ladder. And then there's others that feel like 17.5 is, is a spec class and has nothing to do with skill level. Yeah. That, that is where the disconnect is. And there needs to be a clear ladder to get to mod. There needs to be incentives to make it to mod to the highest level. Um, and at this point, there isn't because you get the same trophies for winning stock or uh, people enjoy the stock classes. And I, I'm not going to fault for people for enjoying the stock classes. What I fault is the lack of a proper ladder to get to the elite classes. And we've mixed up the, the skill level versus the spec classes as, you know, we, I look at it as, as it's, it should be a ladder to get to the elite classes. But it hasn't worked out that way within the industry. And there's a lot of focus put on the stock classes, almost sometimes more than, than the elite mod classes, which boggles my mind. I don't understand it. But within the industry, there's a lot of companies making a lot of money off the stock classes. So I understand where kind of where that's coming from. So there's more to it than just, you know, people wanting to spend money and run a class. That's there's more to it. it and we need a distinct ladder to get to the elite classes and we need the the incentive and the the the, the want to get to the elite mod classes. Right now there isn't. Yeah, I think that's my biggest issue is it just polluted that ladder. So anyways, yep. let's move on. Uh, Jason Mills asks, different type of races. We've seen the classics and one enduro. What else have RC racers come up with? You know what? I was just talking about this the other day. You know what we need to bring back? Our snake races. Yeah. <laughs> That's no, what we no need. Marshals. <laughs> no marshals. No marshals. <laughs> those are some of the most fun races and probably some of the most intense. Um, and they're probably the most fun to watch for spectators, too, truthfully. Um, the spectators are awesome. Or, excuse me, well, they are. But snake races are awesome. <laughs> um, God, I, I really wish... I hope we can do one at some point this year, just because it was so much fun when I've done it in the past. You know, I, I don't think I've ever done a snake race. You'd I, love it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm a big so, fan of Enduros. Those I'm, are I am, too. And I have so much another fun. one soon. So Some of the back... most fun. I've done, I've done three-hour Nitro Enduros on-road and off-road, and they have been some of the most fun races I've ever uh, taken part in. So fun. Yeah, I want to... I really want to get back to that. I think we need one soon. Um, so at Mike's RC World, at the end of the 2011-2012 season, we did a snake race for both forms of short course. But it was every short course in the class on the track at once. 21 two-wheel drive short courses on this tiny little clay track. Go wrong. <laughs> it... Oh my god, it was fun. It was so awesome. And we did it for 15 four-wheel drive short courses. That was wow. the first race I ever won. It was awesome. <laughs> it was the most chaotic thing I've ever seen to this day. But we need to do that again, because it was sweet. So, I there's some videos somewhere. Uh, I think it just resurfaced on Facebook the other day. Um... I, I don't think he listens to the show, but uh, Terry Yo, or if anyone can contact Terry Yo, ask him about that. I think he has access to the video somewhere, or he would know where to find it. Because um, it was awesome. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's that from Jason. I would say that snake races, enduros, I mean, are obviously awesome. Um I really, I mean, there. I haven't really seen a whole lot else in forms of races. I mean, we've tried some like goofy stuff, just messing around at Die Hard at night uh, in the summer, um, but there wasn't really anything that stuck. You know, there's um, different forms like like Reedy style and you know heads up and if Mark qualifying, all that kind of stuff's a little bit different, but ultimately it all plays out the same. Exactly. Yeah. So there is always that. Um, next question is from uh, Nick Colander. Oh, no. 
<laughs> was Colin Branch always a sex symbol, or was he just born like that? Well, I, I, I've got the answer to that. I'm Canadian, so I was born this way. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> Shane Borden asks, biggest surprise for the silly season, and why you think some waited so long to reveal what they were doing? Not Travis. <laughs> wow! Ouch! <laughs> Calling you out. <laughs> yep. <laughs> You're savage, Elliot. <laughs> I, I told you we had to get Elliot back on the show soon. <laughs> uh, um, you know, it, I think some people have not listened to our last episode yet because <laughs> I think we talked about this it, pretty in depth, didn't we? Yeah, we covered it pretty well the last show. Um. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Kobe moving to Techno in the Northwest was a pretty big thing. Yeah, I didn't um, even know about it. until Nobody saw that it. coming. So he, he did a really good job of keeping that one quiet. Good for him. Yeah. Um, but you nationally? Should. Nationally? I don't know. Um, or internationally? Um, I don't know. Bear Tone leaving Kyosho, maybe? That was a big... Big that deal. was a big move. It was more even a bigger move because he's still running the car. So I'm, I, I think all signs are pointing he's going to go Infinity. And then but... Savoya going to Kyosho. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big one, too. It is a big one. Yeah, I don't know what inspired that move. I guess I know Kyo- Kyosho, America, or Kyosho Europe is France. So I guess maybe that was a big part of it. But I know they talked about this pretty in depth on the uh, No Name RC podcast. And uh, I don't want to get myself or this show in trouble by paraphrasing any of the things that were said about that move so i guess just go <laughs> listen to that episode uh, and listen to jq's yeah. take on it yeah but, uh... yeah and then there's <laughs> you know um uh, oh s works picked up uh tim and uh his son tim and camden kim, although tim and camden that was kind of all... a big thing we, it was a big thing, but we all knew they were going somewhere. We and did. As it got closer, Esperance became more obvious. Yep, that wasn't uh, wasn't a surprise that he left after the the year was finished. <laughs> I'm trying to trying to pick my words on that one. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah. Um. Next question from Nick again is talk about what Die Hard does well and how other tracks can replicate the culture around the globe. I mean, we talk about that a lot. I guess to paraphrase that or to sum it up would just be um, just try and appeal to people who aren't RC racers and just create a inviting environment and just get out and talk to people. Uh, wait for Stop waiting for people to come to you. Go to them. You know what the biggest thing for me is that Die Hard does or doesn't do? is they don't cater to the fast, whiny, top drivers. They cater to the the newer, novice, intermediate drivers. And that is where the growth, I feel, is coming from. Yep. Yep. I completely agree. If you start catering to, to the pros, who ultimately spend very little money within the store at TRCR, Mm-hmm. Or at any local hobby shop. Oh, they'll, they'll tell you different, but yes. Right. So, cater to the newer racers, the majority, the middle, you know, the the bottom 70% of racers is what, and God, I, I said this before, the bottom 70%. It's not the bottom 70%. It's the the majority of racers instead mm-hmm. of the, the elite racers. And I feel like you'll be more successful. Yep, hundred um, percent. Yeah, I you know I've got really nothing else to say on that. That's that's pretty accurate. Um, oh God! All right, so Kenny asks. <laughs> oh Jesus! All right, so yeah, Kenny love you, Johnson, Kenny. <laughs> Kenny Johnson asks, "What do you think about saucing and tire warmers for off road?" Yeah. Oh. Depends on the surface. Why did everyone bring up the can of worms? I put up, like, somehow my most engaging question post ever for, like, a short turnaround podcast. And, like, everyone wants to talk about the things that just get me going. Well, then I, I can start. I can start. Why, did, why you don't you gather just, your... 
Why don't you just take this question? Oh, okay. I won't even answer it because I I have like twenty ish episodes detailing my feelings on this. So <laughs> I'll let it call an answer. My thoughts are this. If people are going to do it, then they're gonna do it. And if it, they're gaining an advantage, more people are going to do it. I personally am not a fan of it, but there's nothing that we can do to stop it. Banning it or whatever, I think, is is pointless. So if you feel there's an advantage to doing it, go out and spend the money to do it. You're going to buy your $250, $300 tire warmer, and you're going to take the time to do it, and you're going to sauce, and you're going to, uh, you know, affect your health with the sauce or whatever and you're just going to do it so i'm going to resist doing it as long as i can just because i don't i don't like it i don't want to spend the money on it and i i have a feeling the sauce has been affecting me lately so not lately but last year when i was running on clay so i'm going to avoid it as long as i can and there's not, nothing we can do until there's a rule against it. But even when there's a rule against it, go to Reedy. It'll, you'll see that whether it's allowed or not, it's happening. Not specifically with tire heaters, but you know, you're down there and it's 75, 80 degrees. How warm is it in your car? Put those tires that have been sauced with your secret sauce on the dash of the car. How warm are they going to get? About the same as a tire heater. Mm-hmm. You can't you can't regulate that stuff. So it's gonna happen, and if it's if it's happening, then so be it. I'm going to avoid it as long as I can. I I don't need to win that badly. Yeah. So you know, that's I think that's that's that. If people are going to do it, then they're going to do it. <laughs> I like. There you go. I like beating the ones that are doing it, though. That's always fun. Yeah, always. <laughs> well, perfect. Well, you know what? That's a great way to, to end our questions. Um, Elliot, before we uh, let you go here and we get on to our last part of the show, is there anything that you would like to add since I've given you this platform? <laughs> uh, why you go from the spot like that? Not that I can think of. Sweet. So you're going to be at Hobby Expo, obviously, right? Heck yeah. Are you RDing at all during Hobby Expo weekend? That is yet to be decided. Oh, you should <laughs> totally do it. That's what Travis said. But I'm like, mm. <laughs> this race is for the spectators, not the racers, which That's we're going right. to get into later, I'm sure. So if oh, you yeah. feel like you can go out there and put on a show in front of the spectators on the microphone, do it. I think you would be excellent. Well, I'll take that into consideration. <laughs> Indeed, dude. Well, thanks a ton, buddy, for coming on. and I appreciate you uh, you contributing to the RCU segment and being a fly on the wall for the listener questions. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Alright, so, welcome to the new segment we're adding for Trackwalk 2020. Uh, <laughs> The uh, let it out segment. So this is pretty much the end of the show where we are going to talk about basically whatever is kind of getting us right now. Um, All the things that are, I think, stuff that I didn't really want to pollute the rest of the podcast with. And um, so with this, there's probably going to be a decent amount of language and some topics that probably people don't want to hear about. Um, and you know, if that's your thing, then I, I do apologize and you can go ahead and end the, the podcast now. Um, but the, you've been warned, so we are going to kind of get into it and, uh, well, we'll just see where it takes us this week. So I've got something I need to rant about, and this is, this is relevant right now because there has been a, uh, GoFundMe and lots of promotion and it's been around, Everybody's seen it. I know they have the GoFundMe for Randy Sides. And I believe there's been four or five people donated in over a month. That is it. Now, I know that most people know Randy and his family. 
and the amount that's been donated so far to help them is really disappointing to me. Last time I looked, it was at $87. That doesn't buy one day of medication for Randy. And the amount of money and time that he has put into the Northwest RC scene between, you know, personally and through his business, his RC shop has sponsored races all over the place. And even when the shop was closed, he was sponsoring RC races because he loves this hobby. He loves this family and we need to give back and we need to show him that we appreciate him. So follow the link, donate what you can. I know money's tight for a lot of people, but a few dollars here and there really, it, it really is going to help them a lot. And I hate to make this part of the rant, but I've never seen a, a GoFundMe for such a great cause get such a, a really poor uh, response from our family here in the Northwest. So if, if you can donate, please do. Every dollar helps. And we want to see Randy continue with our family doing what he what he's always done so open open your checkbooks or your paypal and send a few dollars please it's really going to help that's all i got to say 100 percent, dude well played the uh the if you're listening to this you know that the the link for the gofundme is in the description so um, and I said, it's something I need to do too. I haven't been able to donate to it yet. Um, I think I get paid tomorrow, so I probably will throw a couple bucks in there. I mean, look, even if you can't put a lot in, like do something right. I had to go fund me not that long ago and a, a pretty ridiculous amount was raised. And for something that wasn't nearly not, not even a 10th as serious. So like, I, I understand that's just one of the things I'm like, it's not that, we're not we're not trying to make you feel shitty for not donating, but it's like also at the same time, like, dude, just come on, like help this guy out. Because even if you don't know him, like Colin and I can attest to everything that this dude has done for the well, honestly, I mean, it, it, it is at an industry level here in the Northwest. There has not been a whole lot of people that has contributed as much to the region as Randy has and his family has. Right. On top of just being some genuinely good people who are going through kind of the worst shit you can. Yep. So. Yep. And I'm sure most of us have raced in a class where he's bought the trophies for that class. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you know it or not. Exactly. So. Yeah. Come on. Help. 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 Help out a fellow racer because, you know, we have all been in that position where we've, <laughs> well, we all would be in that position where like, if we needed help, you know, it, I think we would all hope that our family would step up and, um, to see that not happening is really unfortunate. So yeah, it, you know, step up guys, you know, that, help, help that's, them out. yep. That's what's grinding my, my spur <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> this week. I love it. Cool. Uh, Colin, did you have anything else you want to talk about? Nope. I think that's a good note to end on. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, in that case, thank you everybody for listening to episode number 29 of the track walk RC podcast. Thank you guys so much for joining us as always. Thank you for your continued support. Um, whether my rant made it into the episode or not. Um, I really do appreciate each and every one of you that support the podcast. Uh, and thank you to those who go the extra mile and support us on Patreon. We really appreciate it. And I promise I will find a way to make it even more worth your while than the early episodes. So I appreciate it. And I appreciate you guys liking what we do enough to feel like that, uh, you actually want to contribute something like your hard earned money to what we do. Um, that means a lot. So thank you. Um, I don't know when episode 30 is going to be out. I really don't. We have some plans for maybe a crossover with that scale RC show pretty soon, but I don't know if that's going to happen I don't know when that's going to happen. It might not happen before Hobby Expo. We might not have another episode till February. I really don't know. Um, so, obviously, 
well, you'll see, I guess, if, if you get one in, in January or not. I'll make sure to announce it. But I would, I guess, plan on February. So, um, for all of you guys that are going to Hobby Expo, if this is our last episode until then, uh, that that don't really talk to us that often because I know we have a lot of diehard racers and a lot of people that are coming over um, that actually don't converse with Colin and I very much. Come say hi. Uh, tell us what you think about this, the uh, you know the topics that we bring up because I know Colin and I on occasion take on some pretty controversial angles and like I'm down to have those conversations anytime. I like to talk, obviously, and hence the podcast was started. So. Anytime that you guys want to just, you know, chat about whatever, like it doesn't have to be on a show format. Like, dude, I will talk to you guys whenever you want. And I would love to debate you guys on stuff and just come say hi. Cause we want to get to know you too. We want to get to know who we're talking to. Um, that's the big benefit about what we do is we get to race with you guys every weekend. So, um, I, we can't you wait know, to bring hobby expo to you for sure. Speaking of hobby expo, I have a bit of a rant. Oh yeah. That. This is what I was missing. You know what? Yeah. 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 Throw that in there. Yeah, so Hobby Expo is going to have a lot of spectators. And Die Hard and its amazing program has been built on bringing new people in. And this 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 race at Hobby Expo is hopefully going to bring in more new people. So this race is being focused more on keeping spectators involved, making it interesting for them, and it growing our hobby than it is about us elite RC racers who have been doing this forever, who think that this is the next world championship, because it's not. This is, it's going to be a great race. It's going to be fun. It's going to be competitive, but it is for the spectators. And we need to do things thinking about spectators watching us at all times. Which means the heads up qualifiers that everybody's bitching about. You're right. We don't like heads up qualifying as any more than you do. But in front of an audience like this, if Mark qualifiers make absolutely zero fucking sense to anybody that's not in this industry, it is boring to watch. Nobody cares. That car's out front, but he's in fifth place. How does that make any sense? That isn't going to bring people into the hobby. So suck it up. Run your heads up qualifiers. And have fun. Have a good time. You're still going to finish in the same position you normally would have finished anyway for the most part. Put on a good show for the spectators. Grow our hobby. And you will get paid back later, you know, in spades. With the amount of new people that potentially can be brought back into our hobby. And this is where Die Hard does such a great job of bringing people into the hobby, doing stuff like this. And then other tracks just want to keep following the status quo. And they're dying. And numbers are shrinking. Well, this is going to help us grow and become even bigger and stronger than we already are. So stop your bitching about your heads-up qualifiers. It's one race. Nobody fucking cares. Go race, have fun, and that's it. Think yep. about the spectators. There you go. There's my rant. I 100% agree with you. Suck it up. It's one race. If you don't understand the mission, right, we're not doing this for you. Understand the mission. Understand it's for the hobby. And I, right. I, I love heads up, drag, uh, heads up qualifying, excuse me. I love it. I think it should just be implemented anywhere. Colin doesn't feel the same way, but we both agree that this is necessary for this race. You want to know why? Because qualifying sucks. Qualifying sucks. We do way too much qualifying. Yeah. Nobody qualifies as much. So, get off your soapbox. 
just show up and race. Yep, and if you're going to bitch about it, go home. We don't want you. Yep. Plain and simple. There, I said it. Okay. I like it. <laughs> In that case, yeah. Well, thank you guys, everyone, for joining us on episode 29. Really appreciate your support. We'll be back with uh, episode 30, hopefully very soon. Hopefully sooner than not. We'll see how quickly we can get this move done. But uh, for those of you who won't have a podcast episode in time, we'll see you at Hobby Expo. Later, guys. Once again, fuck cancer. <laughs> <laughs>